an iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? History, we are told, is made by heroic leaders. This is a film about Leo Tolstoy's brilliant novel, War and Peace. War and Peace is a truly magnificent literary achievement. It is also an extended essay on the role of leadership in history. The war of War and Peace was a conflict between Russia and France, culminating in the French invasion of Russia in 1812. The climactic battle of that war was fought here at Borodino, not far from Moscow. By nightfall on September 7th, 1812, some 40,000 French soldiers and some 45,000 Russian soldiers lay dead or wounded on this field. They are memorialized by this monument. This is not, however, a film about French history or about Russian history. It is film about leaders. War and Peace argues the stories of heroic leaders creating history are myths. The main source of the movement in history, the history is determined not by, not by the leaders, but by the will of, of people, mm -hmm. of these million, ordinary, put it ordinary. a million of wills of ordinary people. The standard catechism of leadership proclaims that individual leaders are vitally important to history. Napoleon and his generals prepare for battle, confident that their decisions matter. The moment the time arrives, you'll attack and inform me when the attack has begun. In St. Petersburg, we spoke with Lev Lurie, an historian, TV documentary producer, and professor of political science. Here's what he had to say about the view of Napoleon found in War and Peace. 
from his point of view, Napoleon is also made in, in historical Hollywood. Mm -hmm. It is an actor. Yeah. It okay. is, a, I don't know, Eddie Murphy who is playing yeah. the president of the United States because he, by chance he... Sure. he yeah. uh, it is a small, stu not stupid, but very unpleasant yeah. person mm -hmm. who is li loving, loving himself more mm -hmm. than anybody else, yeah. who is an actor, yeah. and not very good actor, yeah. a false actor. Yeah. Napoleon and the Tsar meet and honor each other for their leadership. This is a meeting too long delayed. I too am delighted. We create heroic narratives about leaders to make order out of the chaos of history. A narrative really is man's desire to believe that there's rationality to what happens. And he wants a compelling storyline that has mm -hmm. a beginning, a a, a critical moment of choice and then a denouement and you can look at this whole thing and say now I understand what happened and why and it's it's coherent inside itself. This quest for coherence leads nations to honor their leaders with stories of heroism and genius. This striking statue in Moscow is of Pyotr Ivanovich Bagration one of the major Russian military leaders in the battles described in War and Peace. He is represented here in a classic heroic pose. The basic message of War and Peace is that such heroic portrayals and their implicit characterization of leadership as important in history is fundamentally nonsense. They tell a good and familiar story, but they do not describe reality. History is inexorably the uh, distortion of the past. And it's the issues that we are concerned with today that we go back and choose narratives to explore. History is politics projected into the past. Heroic stories of leadership are standard. He is also present at the president's The leadership myth is not limited to stories of heroes. It extends to stories of villains. The villains of history, like the heroes, are portrayed as producing the histories in which they are involved. Conceptions of leaders as making history lead inexorably to the inclination of successful leaders to vilify and even execute unsuccessful leaders. Natasha, you write history. Uh, well, it's modern American television version of history. Uh, are there heroes and villains in your histories? Yeah, in order to make a news report, you just have to have two sides. You have a good person and a bad person, and you basically uh, try to analyze the story by putting them against each other. In Manila, the United States Military Commission hears the final witness in the trial of Japanese General Masaharu Homa. Is the villain as much a myth as the hero? Madame Homa takes the stand to defend her husband, accused in the needless deaths of 17,000 American and Philippine soldiers after their surrender on the Bataan Peninsula. In history, we, we create villains as well as heroes. The villains are the losers. We have war criminals, and war criminals always turn out to be on the side of the losers. The commission sentences you to be shot to death with musketry. It's very important to have those, to attribute the historical events to the evil intentions of individuals. Thus, the stories of history are cast in terms of the actions and intentions of leaders. Such stories are universal. But so also, is skepticism about them. War and Peace argues that leadership is a myth by which both leaders and followers simplify a history that is too complex for them to comprehend. Andrei Bolkonsky muses about leaders and their successes. I don't know what is meant by an able general. Well, one that 
foresees the adversary's intentions. That's really quite impossible for the most part, since the adversary never knows them himself. Yeah. <laughs> Yet they say that war is like a game of chess, don't they? Hmm. Who says it? The people who fight wars from armchairs. In chess, you can think over a move as long as you like. In war, one doesn't have that luxury. In chess, a knight is always stronger than a pawn, and two pawns are always stronger than one. In war, a battalion is sometimes stronger than a division. Ah, uh, you get into battles like Fallujah, and there was no internal coherency, because you had different sets of actors with different power institutions behind them who weren't talking to one another at all. The insurgency was a bottom-up affair being fought at the corporal level. And the corporals actually had a better understanding of what they were up against than many of the generals. But no general could ever admit that. Mm -hmm. So as a consequence, we went through a series of generals over there who were really out of touch with what was going on. It was remarkable to be out there and have the opportunity of being again with the corporals mm -hmm. out on the lines and then going back to talk mm -hmm. to the generals and, and seeing this huge disconnect. Let alone when you tried to go to the civilian level that supposedly were above the generals, and they, they did not have the slightest idea what was going on in the battlefield. Are they still there? Yes, sir. The Russians are still there. Napoleon is puzzled by the way in which the Battle of Borodino comes to an end without his orders. I hear no sounds of battle. No, sir. The fighting has ceased. I gave no orders. They just seem to have stopped of their own accord. After Borodino, General Kutuzov patiently explains to his generals that no matter what they may wish, the Russian army will not respond to an order to attack. I say we can. It needs but a small extra effort. But a small extra effort. In killed and wounded, we have lost a third of our force. And for what? We stopped them on the road to Moscow. Well, we are not strong enough to stop them, and we do not need to stop them. In Moscow, we talked to Nikolai Katryov, a leading Tolstoy scholar about the theory of history in war and peace. Prometheus, Cain, Napoleon. Napoleon. Yes, that, those are the people. Yeah. Part of the Tolstoy, the war and peace story, that all narratives of history are false. Yes, yes. No. Naturally. No. And they are all true. All of them. <laughs> Because any narrative about history is a story. It seems to me that Napoleon is simply a catalyst used by Tolstoy to comment on history. Yes, oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. What are they talking about? Is a man a military genius because he knows when to order up the biscuits? And Napoleon is no exception. He thinks he commands a million men, moving them here, there, and everywhere. But really, he follows them. They have not been brought to the borders of Russia by him, but by forces beyond our comprehension. Napoleon is just a straw thrown to the fore in the wind they make. He's just a banner that they hold aloft. Rather than living in worlds in which the causes of outcomes are clear and the definitions of success and failure are unproblematic, Leaders live in worlds in which causality is unclear and the evaluation of outcomes is ambiguous. There she is lying at my feet, awaiting her destiny. Strange, beautiful, majestic. But why is it taking so long for the municipal delegation to come and pay its respects? Rather than living in a world in which there is a tight coupling between problems and solutions, between information and action, leaders live in a world in which those linkages are elusive. Moscow is vide. Tout le monde est parti.
In spite of the unpredictabilities of the daily world, war and peace extols the beauties of ordinary life. According to Tolstoy's logic, the true beauty is inside people's yes. minds and, and inside their souls. They do what they should do, and that's why the spiritual beauty is the only, uh, the only true beauty. Countess Natalia Rostova and Prince Andrei Bolkansky have fallen in love, and he has proposed to her. Князь Андрей не находил в своей душе прежней любви к ней. В душе его вдруг повернуло что-то. Не было прежней поэтической прелести желания, а была жалость к ее женской и детской слабости. Absurdity permeates critical relationships in peace and in war. For Natasha's brother Nikolai, engaging in his first battle, events and their causes seem disconnected. Что же это? Я не подвигаюсь. Я упал. Я убит. Что это за люди? Неужели французы? Господи, Боже, тот, кто там на этом небе, спаси, прости и заступи меня. Неужели как тебе? И зачем? Убить меня. А может быть и убить меня. Кого так любят все? I think that Tolstoy is still accurate because there's a desire for self-heroism, and that's what they focus upon. They don't focus upon the mud and the blood and the mistakes and the things that they did wrong. You very rarely hear about them. They, they focus on those moments when there was a clear challenge and they overcame it. So we do have a tendency as human <clears throat> beings to to compartment what we want to remember, or at least what we want to share with anybody else. In War and Peace, there are no heroes. The characters struggle with the absurdity of life. There is no reliable link between actions and consequences. The virtuous are not rewarded. Captain Tushin. Tushin's battery is effective in battle, but he is denounced to Prince Bagration. In Iraq, no one has failed. I mean, every general has done brilliantly and been promoted, and yet we've changed strategy four times. <laughs> Now, this is one reason why you don't find much learning there. Because if those who've come before, who haven't done well, are promoted and they're now your senior, you're not going to criticize what they did. You just change the strategy. Well, this, this doesn't make a lot of sense. And then the president gives medals of freedom to people who've screwed up. Tushin is rescued by Andrei Bolkonsky, who demands that justice be done. Вы меня изволили послать к батарее капитана Тушина. Я был там и нашел две трети людей и лошадей перебитыми, два орудия исковерканными и прикрытий никакого. И ежели ваше сиятельство позволите мне высказать свое мнение, то успехом дня мы обязаны более всего действию этой батареи и геройской стойкости капитана Тушина с его ротой. Капитан Тушин, можете идти. Вот спасибо. Выручил колупчик. Perhaps Captain Tushin deserves a medal, but he will never get one.
Putin had competence, he knew how to do what he did, and he did it well. And he's on the side of his friends, yes. who are Russians. Yes, yes. Not, m not that, much more. And that's all. He's going do, doing yes. a good job. When he deals with the higher authorities, they ignore him. He's not solving problems, yes. it's they who are solving yes. it. But from history's point of view, they are not. Tushins, many Tushins. Tushins not Tushins. one Tushin, but Tushin yeah, is a part. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. In War and Peace, history is not made by individual heroes, little people, or leaders. On the eve of the Bardino battle, Andre ridicules Pierre's idea that a skilled commander can make a difference. He says, what faces us tomorrow? A hundred million of the most varied possibilities, which will be decided instantly by who runs or will run away, theirs or ours by whether this one or that is killed. The basic idea. History involves a complex system of interacting actors and actions. War and Peace tells us unnoticed causes are important. Some phenomena may be predictable, but not controllable. Why did Moscow burn? not because specific people ignited it, but because people abandoned it. Once abandoned, it would burn. So the idea of objective, in my own writing of history, I realized at a certain point that I had come to an impossible point. I could write no more because I could not document and confirm everything, which was the standard you're being forced against. At some point, historians have to become fiction writers. And good history has an element of fiction in it. It has to. The issue is how much you struggle for objectivity and how you can weave a series of, of views together. History is absurd. After Pierre Bazukov is captured in Moscow, the French officer interrogating him is called to eat so he casually sentences Pierre to be shot. But ultimately, Pierre, for no observable reason, is spared. War and Peace tells us that history cannot be controlled by individuals. Innocence is better than cleverness. Passivity is better than ambition. Figures who appear in history cannot be important. These generals, displayed here in front of the Battle of Borodino Museum, are major Russian heroes of the battle. These cannon, on the other hand, are reminders of the overlooked importance of minor people doing their jobs well. In War and Peace, ordinary competence in mundane matters is pictured as more significant than genius in command. The quiet competence of the artillery officer Tushin is contrasted with the bombast of irrelevant generals. In a modern world, Ordinary competence is found in the bureaucrats, the rules, the complex networks of organizations. We're at the Copenhagen Business School, and I'm visiting Mariana Riesberg, who's an academic administrative something. Yeah, officer. Officer, yeah. yes. And I visited this school for something like 35 years, and when I ask people who is indispensable, they don't mention the dean or the rector, they mention Mariana Riesberg. What do you do, Mariana? What do I do? It's not just one thing, it's many, many things. I, I know whom to call when it, 
for a specific piece of information. Mm -hmm. So you have a network of contacts around the school. Yes. You've been here 20 years, ever since you were three years old, as I, <laughs> yes, yes. As I understand. Mm -hmm. So you have a memory of mm -hmm. what has happened and how it happened and how to do things. Mm -hmm. And if they had a problem, they called up Mariana and said, this is a problem, do something about it. Yeah. And, and we have leaders and we have what you referred to earlier as the little people. Yeah. But I see it as a kind of a division of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because uh, <laughs> you have all of it, and they no, not necessary. <laughs> but it's division. I know I, I have knowledge of, of a certain area, and they have of a different area, and none of us can actually do without one another. Mm -hmm. By connecting disparate parts of the institution's strengths, Mariana's networks help to build the school's capabilities. Another person building capabilities is yep. Susan Herb. Yep. Susan has been teaching first grade at Park Day School for 33 years. Ah, what's so bad about CO2, says Templeton? Um, it, what's so bad about if CO2? If there's too much, we would die because if we kept breathing it, it's really bad for us, so the leaves suck it in, so, and they let out an oxygen. So they're right. You're both friends. In the world of war and peace, leaders are unimportant. But culture and shared values are essential elements of a nation's capabilities. That's a strategy. What were you going to do? In the modern world, many of those capabilities are produced by millions of teachers, like Susan Erb, working in schools. I need family, friends, food, water, peace in the world, and oxygen. And I want a V4 Tamagotchi, a V2 Tamagotchi. Susan molds the basic building blocks of culture in her first graders self knowledge. Understanding the physical world two of us. and the ability to get along with others in the community. It's really up to you two. Break the record. Have we broken the rules in a while? No. Okay, ready? Here we go. We're not there. Shh, they're doing something important. We're breaking the rules. In the worldview of war and peace, Susan Erb, like Mariana Riesberg in Copenhagen, and Captain Tushin, are part of the throng of millions of competent people who really make history. These people who make a difference are connected in complex social networks that give structure to an apparently chaotic world. The Russian Society of War and Peace is based on elaborate networks of family and personal connections. Thus the emphasis in the novel on arranging marriages, on exploiting connections, and of course, on the salon. I hear you have Pierre Bzuhoff staying with you. Well, since he inherited Bzuhoff's estate, I felt it my duty to take him under my wing. I do hope his manners have improved. He's so rich nobody notices anymore. <laughs> There's Lisa Volkonskaya now. Adorable. It is not hard to imagine in these beautiful rooms in the Yusupov Palace in St. Petersburg, a social gathering at which gossip would be exchanged and favors would be sought and granted. It was in places such as this that the intricate networks of aristocratic Russian life were elaborated and maintained. The primary instruments for maintaining one's position in the Russian social order of war and peace are marriage and inheritance. He won't survive a third stroke. You know, Katish, that you and my wife are his only direct heirs. Ah, it's painful, I know. Still, one must talk. I never cease praying to God that he be merciful. Still, we must be ready. I've sent for Pierre, you know. Well, he asked for him. What does he want him for? He's illegitimate. He can't inherit anything. I've tried to explain to you before. All the old count had to do was to write a letter to the Tsar begging him to make Pierre legitimate. With Prince Vasily's help, Pierre receives his inheritance. Vasily then manipulates the newly wealthy young man into marrying his daughter, Helene. It's going to happen. I know it. They're all expecting it. They're so certain it will happen. 
I can't disappoint them. Well? Nothing. My dear boy, thank God. My wife has just told me. Oh, I'm so happy. I knew your father. I loved him, I may say. Oh, she'll make you such a good wife. My little girl, my little Elaine. Aline, Aline, Anna, come here. Oh, this is wonderful. Wonderful. War and Peace portrays a world permeated with falsity. It is not, however, a world of chaos. Aristocratic family networks and a stable peasant culture infuse Russian life. These elements bring to the unfolding of history an overall capability that General Kutuzov often called Mother Russia. War and Peace pictures peasant life and traditions as the core of Russian strength. Oh, but you should see what a fine job they made of the old place now. A yard full of livestock, and a field full of oats, two other brothers earning wages. Oh, it's a treat to go home to. The peasant brings a culture of elementary values and knowledge that transcends the cleverness and pretensions of leadership. Behind me sits Mikvarova, a Russian village of old believers, located about a thousand kilometers northeast of Moscow and about 500 kilometers west of the Ural Mountains. It consists of about 45 occupied houses with about 100 people. We've come here in search of Mother Russia, that mysterious combination of habits, patience, and competence that describes the culture of traditional peasant life. In War and Peace, the Russian General Kutuzov views Mother Russia both as a teacher and as an ally in his struggles against the French. You have to be able to curse a blue streak here and be able to drink. Yeah, they taught me how to swear, of course. The essence of peasant living is endurance through the turnover of regimes. Peasant life is buffeted by change, but it allows the waves of monarchs and masters to pass over it while holding on to the ability to survive. I can't be without the earth. It's the thing that feeds us. It's our birth mother, how my heart pours out. Everything now is fallow. I cry, I can't sleep at night. Look, my hair is turning gray. It's just awful. <laughs> War and Peace offers numerous minor critiques of peasant life. But one of the book's main themes is a thoroughly romantic portrayal of the peasant, his abilities, and his connection to the land. We never lived in the city. You know, for me, it's always been the power of nature. Where I was born, our cabin was right next to the woods. He was born just like Jesus Christ in a manger, in the hay with the sheep. My mother gave birth. It was a big family. My father really loved nature, and he passed it along to us as an inheritance through our genes. And I love nature, too. When I was just a kid, he gave me a little axe, an axe, and as we were walking, I chipped at the trees in the woods with it. He was very strict and said, don't ever do that, ever. 
I'm ashamed before nature if I take heedlessly. I gather all the twigs I knock down for firewood, and then I feel good. There was war, there was famine. This icon here is from my mother, the icon of Jesus. She set it up for me and my sister and said, say your prayers to Jesus, girls. And she would, and she would uh, tell us to me and my sister. Our father died. He died of hunger. We're crying and praying. How could it not help us? What did people do? We ate other things, leaves, we collected grasses. There was famine. People have their own households. Whoever keeps a cow lives well. That's how we survived. Whoever loves the land lives off it. And if you don't love the land and till it, then it's all over. It is not necessary to accept the romantic peasant mystique to recognize the more general point, that leadership involves developing and using the values and spirit of a culture. In defeating the invading French, General Kutuzov depended on the spirit of Russian peasants and their capacity to survive. That spirit finds expression in dance. This is the rehearsal hall of the song and dance ensemble of the Russian army in St. Petersburg, a group of soldiers and civilians who perform traditional Russian dances. It's really from very long ago. The whole history of Russia is connected to these dances. Our grandfathers, all of them, and our great-grandfathers, they all danced. The Russian spirit supports it. It improves your self-esteem. Unfortunately, now it's become rarer, even in the villages, to see real people dance Russian folk dance who haven't studied it specially. So we are trying somehow to preserve what our ancestors did. My father is a dance master. My brother and grandfather were both artists. It's like I've gone down the family path. It's the soul. That's where it comes from. Without this, a Russian is not a Russian. There's another theme in War and Peace of the importance of the competence of ordinary people. That history is, is created by 
<clears throat> complex combinations of a lot of ordinary people doing their jobs. We talked with sociologist Joel Podolny, dean of the Yale School of Management, to get his perspective on leadership, capabilities, and networks. It's one of the unfortunate facts of the modern literature on leadership that we do tend to overplay the importance of a single individual, the heroic leader. History gives a leader uh, certain artifacts uh, with which to work. Uh, and one of those artifacts is clearly the pattern of relationships, the networks that uh, exist. A savvy leader is going to know that uh, she or he is going to be a lot more effective uh, if she tries to understand uh, what's, the, what's the underlying fabric of relationships and then sort of work with that fabric. War and Peace argues that heroic leadership has little to do with the unfolding of history. However, the novel hints at a different role for leaders. Russian aristocratic society at the beginning of the 19th century was a network of extended families connected by reciprocal favors. In such a society, effective leadership involves exploiting social networks for the capabilities they offer. That perspective has overtones in the 15th century history of Renaissance Florence. And we've come to Florence now to talk with Professor John Paget, a leading scholar of the 15th century Florentine world of Cosimo de' Medici. Cosimo de' Medici did not begin with a grand plan to take over the state. Rather, events sort of swept him into power. It was his networks, his banking networks, that made Venice so happy to see him come, family networks that pulled the people in the street, all these sort of organizational networks are capabilities, you might call them. It didn't allow him to initiate action, but definitely allowed him to respond to action. Now, there are a number of perspectives from which you can view Cosimo de' Medici. The basis of his economic power was the fact that he was a banker to the pope. But he translated this papal connection into organizational capacity, and he funded all sorts of international trade throughout Europe. This room is very similar to what the account book room of the Medici Bank would have looked like. The Florentine bankers and their social networks are the transfers through which customers all over Europe are conducting their business. There's sort of a great deal of trust and security involved that has to be established for this system to work. Account books exist. Uh, as a, as a sign, as a symbol. So each of these uh, pages is actually a social network. It's a person with whom the, the uh, banker is doing business. One of the most familiar scenes in War and Peace is people waiting outside an influential person's door to seek favors or to bring information or to tell them that they are their friends. That's the way the social structure works. We're in Florence, outside of Cosimo de' Medici's house. I'm sitting on the bench where similar people would have sat in the 15th century, waiting to bring things to Cosimo, waiting to ask him for favors, waiting to enter into the basic game of the social network that Cosimo presided over. Jim, we are here in the private chapel of the Palazzo de' Medici, in other words, in the inner sanctum of Cosimo's own home. It's the journey of the Magi. The image of the Magi became developed, you might say, as the mythology that the Medici used to present themselves to the fellow citizens of Florence. Cosimo de' Medici, the gentleman on the donkey probably thinks of himself also as a humble man in spite of his incredible wealth and power. It's a He's, donkey with gilded uh, trappings, of course. Good point. <laughs> and a procession, a, a journey of the Medici family going back through time 
to this castle up there on the hill and going forward in time through following uh, the, the Magi to the baby Jesus. So to understand the process of constructing family and by extension political alliances, it is quite important to think about this practice of giving, gift exchange, food, money, building. This is the raw materials, the raw organizational practices, if you will, that the Florentines use to build uh, their networks. I think in the Medici story that Paget tells so well, I mean, the real brilliance that's there is him recognizing that in point of fact, if you build a network that is goal-directed, it has two problems. One, it's very costly because in order to get people to sign up for that, they know exactly the terms that they can extract. Two, if your goals or your interests ever shift, then you've created this very narrowly defined network that's now focused on doing this when you want to go in that direction. It seems to me there are two sort of basic ways in which people try to make themselves endure. The first is family. That through a family, your genetic and cultural trace goes to your children and from your children to their children and then so on and so on through the generations. The second major way is through the artifacts we create. We make various forms of art, paintings, sculpture, writings of various sorts, and buildings, the various things that we call art. Uh, and these endure long beyond. Now, Cosimo obviously was involved in both of these. Is there any contemporaneous evidence that he was concerned either about his relevance to history or about his mortality? Actually, Jim, the answer to that is very much yes. According to Vespasiano, he thought that people would never remember him five years after he died. The only way that they would remember him is through this art and these buildings, in particular these buildings that he made to influence his children, the grandchildren, us. The building, the cupola, the dome in the middle was not started by Cosimo, but was finished by Cosimo. San Lorenzo was actually renovated and beautified by Cosimo. Badia, the uh, abbey and monasteries in the hills were made by Cosimo. He made his palaces and started an entire palace movement. So if you put all of these things together, banker, statesman, patron, I think you have the conclusion and the image of a Renaissance man. And Cosimo started a regime, the Medician regime, that lasted almost four centuries with one small break. In some sense, you have a kind of goal-free problem solving. You are creating an institution or creating some capabilities or creating some uh, uh, answers without quite knowing what the questions are going to be. There is this idea with vision that it's always about looking forward. But I think if you look at the really powerful visions that get developed to lead groups, to lead social movements, there are typically visions that are grounded in a very strong sense of common identity with strong historical roots. And what the, what the leader's done is to interpret that for everybody. And that act of interpretation actually becomes the basis for building and reinforcing the network. In many ways, that's General Kutuzov in War and Peace. He talks about the soul of Mother Russia. Wo 
with him, find it so In war and peace, advanced planning and strategies to change the course of history are pictured as the pretenses of foolish leaders. General Kutuzov's wisdom, on the other hand, involves going with the flow of history. Михаил Ирионович, что вы думаете о завтрашнем сражении? Я думаю, что сражение будет проиграно. At Austerlitz, he knows all the well-laid plans are for naught. After Borodino, Kutuzov retreats and waits patiently for Mother Russia to prevail. Алексей Петрович, подойди, подойди поближе. Какие ты привез мне весточки? А? Наполеон из Москвы ушел. Поистину так. А? Наполеон ушел из Москвы, Ваша Светлость. Его авангард в Фоминском. In contemporary terms, Kutuzov's wisdom is mystical or instinctive. Спасена Россия. Comprehension cannot be sought. It comes in great random moments that cannot be anticipated. How peaceful. In that spirit, General Kutuzov abandons claims of self-importance and accepts the ironies of life and history. Why did you not pursue the French across the frontier? My instructions were to expel the invader from our soil. Can you really be said to have accomplished your objectives by halting arbitrarily at the frontiers of our country? You have expelled the enemy from Russia. Now it is for us to take over and continue your great work. From now on, I shall assume command of the army myself. War and Peace scorns those who imagine acting decisively in pursuit of a grand plan. It venerates those who are strong enough to be patiently passive and it praises those who can take advantage of whatever strengths they may have. Like Kutuzov, Cosimo de' Medici positioned himself to take advantage of the winds rather than trying to sail against them. He built capabilities without anticipating clearly what would be done with them. It's, uh, really the first Cosimo spent part of each day meditating in his cell at the San Marco Monastery. The entry point that all monks and Cosimo himself would arrive at... This Fra Angelico painting of the Annunciation, which Cosimo commissioned, greeted him every day on the way to his cell. Mary is listening very hard to what the angel is saying, and this is the attitude that monks ought to put on when they enter this particular establishment. Mary is listening. The angel is talking. They are trying to pick up what the angel is saying by listening to yourself.
Perhaps leaders do not change the course of history, but they construct the buildings and commission the art and architecture that enhances our lives. Cosimo de' Medici was a patron of the great Florentine sculptor Donatello. This room is filled with objects produced by Donatello during his life as a client of Cosimo de' Medici. Peace tells us that beauty is found not only in the high art of great artists, but also in the textures of everyday life. Beauty is found in the hunt, in sleigh rides, in dance. <laughs> and in family relations. In modern life, beauty is found in a Florentine restaurant where Giuseppe Alessi recreates recipes from the 15th century. He imbues them not only with extraordinary flavors, but also with his enthusiasm. I use the power of fire. My relationship with fire is based on conflict because clearly fire devours everything. I have to dominate the fire and beat it back with iron to make the food just right. Beauty is found within the harsh wartime life of a Russian village. And the war was still going on, but it makes me want to cry. We had nothing to wear. There was nothing to eat. And then they sent us packages to the town here. Even today, I can remember the taste of that sugar. So when America sent us some rags, we were very happy. Even today, I remember there was a checked skirt with a very fine check. And whenever I see that kind of material, immediately I remember. In fact, I remember almost all of them. This was my brother's shirt. I can remember that. I can remember that this was a skirt that my mom wore. But a lot of these pieces on here, I remember. Beauty is found in the attitude toward life of Ora Noel, who makes quilts to restore good feelings after the deaths of victims of urban violence, including two of her own sons. Well, I'm so glad you guys came. And now you know how to redirect that inner anger. Once you turn it in, let it out. See what I did? I let it all out. And now it's all out there for the public to see. And it didn't hurt anybody, right? If anything, it helps. So you can always find something to do to redirect that inner pain and make it into something good. And don't let it stay in there. Find something to get it out, you know, in a positive way. War and Peace tells us that the passion, the serenity, and the elementary grace of millions of ordinary people create the beauty of everyday life. This room in the Yusupov Palace in St. Petersburg is a reminder that War and Peace embraces an aesthetic response to the images and experiences of life. Nowhere is the dedication of War and Peace to beauty more evident than in the character of Natasha Rostova. Tolstoy is obviously in love with Natasha Rostova. It's true. He's, she's frivolous, she's narcissistic, she's self-indulgent, and yet 
Yeah. He's in love with her. He, because she's natural. She is natural. Yeah. Yes. The main idea of Tolstoy, Tolstoy is to be natural. Yeah. Everything unnatural yes. is, is Napoleon, yeah. is Helen. Yes, uh, yes, mm -hmm. that's right. While scorning attempts to better the world, the novel is enthusiastic about the beauties of daily life. The book's message in its affection for Natasha is that the elements of beauty found in ordinary life are important. Perhaps in some small way, leaders can contribute to recognizing and increasing that beauty. This is the Copenhagen Business School, a site that combines architecture and art to create one of the more beautiful academic environments in the world. Finn Junge Jensen, the longtime rector of CBS, is an old friend of mine. He combines a taste for classical objects of art with a sense of the importance of creating a milieu that stimulates an aesthetic experience. One of the conspicuous things about CBS is the art and architecture. Uh, you've built some very striking buildings. Why? I think that forms an environment which gives inspiration, opportunities, because you are living in it and living as part of it, and it makes for more enthusiastic, dedicated students who feel themselves more or less at home here. It, creates an environment which uh, makes for curiosity. If you cannot create environments where you also stimulate inspiration, things you cannot explain, emotions which are of a variety of kinds, uh, then you do not develop uh, entrepreneurs, uh, people who do things differently. What I hear you say is that a beautiful setting of architecture and art creates a beautiful community, and even, if I could use the term, beautiful people. But it creates uh, at least uh, more suitable conditions for the development of beautiful uh, activities and people. Of course, there's no uh, guarantee, unfortunately, but, uh, but still it stimulates a sense of doing things at a high level because it speaks to your senses and your non-conscious ways of thinking. I think it is as important to recognize that there are essential elements of beauty no, okay. as there are to recognize there are essential answers in mathematics. Right. Uh, I'm glad we agree. Beauty reigns above all. <laughs> it's only the beauty that we <laughs> have on the way that makes any difference. Okay, let's the bring beauty. to the beauty. Two beauties, I can <laughs> The earth, the earth, it feeds us, it gives all. You just have to lay your hands to it, and there will be fertility, and there will be everything. I will never forget the love and brotherhood that was between him and me. That's a very interesting question, how such a friendship credit world was constructed, so crucial to the liquidity of Europe, when in fact, people in general don't trust each other. It's, it's about your, your kiss. Your kiss is as, uh, is as hot as a pancake. War and Peace assures us that heroic stories of leaders are the work of our imagination. These fables of heroic leaders give pleasure. They can be admired and repeated without accepting them as reality. History is not made by leaders. It is made by millions and millions of peasants and first grade teachers. War and Peace argues that the effectiveness of an organization depends less on heroic leadership than on myriads of common people organized into complex social networks and doing their jobs well. It depends on enduring cultures that nourish and reproduce those capabilities. Прочь. 
Я, блин, с тобою ел всю ночь. Дуля! Leadership involves allowing the competence of ordinary people and their networks to flower without trying to strike heroic poses. It involves creating objects and surroundings of beauty and encouraging individual contributions to the elementary grace of everyday life. That's where the sand is. That's where the sand is. If you want a darker blue, this is a darker blue. I let my doubts go. And I ate pancakes with you all night. Dunya, I love my pancakes. Dunya. So it's not about pancakes. <laughs> no Russian song is about pancakes. In the world of war and peace, truth and beauty are precious. But beauty is less elusive than truth. Dunya, твои блины вкусны, твои блина в огонь нежный вкус, твои блина. Thank you.